Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Geraldine McGahey, I'm the Chief Commissioner of the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. This discussion is being filmed for broadcast as part of this year's FELA. Education, and in particular educational attainment, is a major issue of concern for the Equality Commission and it has been for many years. So much so that education is one of our key strategic objectives for the coming period. COVID-19 has shone a very significant light on educational issues, particularly the attainment of our children during a period of lockdown. And as we come out of lockdown, many parents have issues that they would like addressed. They have concerns as to how the educational system is going to work going forward. Today, I've invited a number of guests to come and engage in a discussion a discussion on issues that you, the parents, have tweeted into the Commission, uh, issues that are of burning concern to you. Can I just take this opportunity now to invite my colleagues and to introduce themselves and give us a flavour of the issues that are of significant importance to you. Kula, can I maybe just start with you? Hi, thank you, um, Geraldine. So I'm Kuli Asuma and I'm the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. So uh, uh, as, as it says on the tin, it's um, my job and my colleagues at NICI to make sure children's rights are a reality um, across Northern Ireland and across a number of functions and, and issues. And of course, education is key. Every child um, it, um, is subject to education in some shape or form. Um, just very quickly, you know, some of the issues that have come out of COVID and during the pandemic are many and varied when it comes to education. I mean, the first thing is the good news is that um, our jurisdiction was the first on these islands to address the free school meals issues. We did it for 95% of the children within two or three weeks of the lockdown and um, did it in a way that preserved the dignity of families. It wasn't vouchers, it wasn't parcels. It gave them money so they, that they could buy food um, and, and um, the remaining 5% got coverage a few, a, uh, a few weeks ago, but we're up and running. But there are a range of other issues that are looking forward to discussing today, including for children with special educational needs um, and also the quality of the education that children have received at home. But I'm sure we'll be talking more about I'm that sure later. Betty. Hello, um, my name is Betty Carlyle. I'm the director of Shanko Women's Centre. Um, we deliver education in a community type way. It's more to women and young women. Um, we do have childcare. We have childcare that backs up that education if women want to do classes. And we have a business of childcare where, whereby, even if it's a baby, it's still getting stimulated and educated in some way. Um, throughout the, the COVID thing, we've been supporting um, a lot of young mothers, young lone mothers. Um, who've been trying to teach their kids at home and people who have been doing courses with us that had to come to an end because of lack of childcare and various things of looking after mm -hmm. children while we're home. And we we work mainly in North and West Belfast. Okay, thank you, Betty. Anne. Hello, I'm <coughs> Anne Pendleton and I am the current project manager with an organisation called Full Service Community Network. We're based in West Belfast and in particular we're based in two educational areas, Upper Springfield and Greater Falls, um, and areas of um, high deprivation. I suppose one of the reasons why we're funded by the Department of Education's Tackling Education Disadvantage Team. And we work with up to 29 schools, nursery, primary and post-primary. Our main job, we have a team of qualified teachers and one youth worker, and our main job is to provide additional support to children who've been identified through the schools as in need of um, either for low or under achievement in need of support. For us, I think the biggest challenge in COVID is where um, we have children who, for, for whom English is their uh, second language and parents who, for whom they don't have very, very little English. So there's a challenge there and an anxiety to support their needs given that they maybe don't have Wi-Fi, don't have money for laptops and computers parents can't help them with their homework. So that's been a, that's been a challenge. Um, they have been in, self, in isolation because the fear of, um, in terms of the, um, I suppose the, their experiences and experiences of people of color in terms of the pandemic and the, and the statistics. So there's an, um, an anxiety there. If anxieties from, I mean, some of those children have not, have, have had long interrupted periods of education. And so therefore, 
not having school, been schooled the last 15 weeks has been an additional challenge and a stress for those children. So we've been managing to provide counselling support um, for our schools. So That's some good. of the issues I'm sure we'll be talking about again, okay. but there are some of the challenges. No. Hello, my name is Noel Purdy. Uh, I'm a director of the Centre for Research and Educational Underachievement at Stramellis University College here in Belfast. Um, uh, my uh, interest in this um, extends as a teacher, qualified teacher, a teacher educator, uh, a researcher, but also as a parent, uh, a parent who's been homeschooling uh, over the last three months, although thankfully that has now finished. Um, I wrote a blog very early on in lockdown um, around what I saw as likely inequalities uh, around homeschooling and talking and flagging up the issue of the digital divide that I, I, I imagined would be uh, a problem. And we followed that up. It seemed to really touch a nerve actually at the time, back in April, seems like a long time ago now. Uh, but we followed it up, up with a, a parental survey, um, which was completed by over 2000 parents right across Northern Ireland. And, and that supported my initial fears, really, around some of the inequalities which have emerged uh, through this experience of homeschooling. There's lots to talk about. I'll, I'll maybe keep my comments uh, for, for later on in the discussion, but, but I'll be basing a lot of it on the research that we carried out and subsequent okay. blog posts actually as well through the Centre for Research and Educational Underachievement. Okay. As I said, um, our questions today have come from parents who have many concerns about their educational standards for their children. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to address all of those today, but they do centre around some key themes. And I'm going to come back to you, Noel, because uh, the Commission has published uh, a report in terms of the key inequalities in education in Northern Ireland. And one of the issues within that is the um, poor attainment of children who are in receipt of free school meals, for the want of a better term, or categorisation. But, and there's a lot of understanding out in the community that perhaps those children and those inequalities are going to be perhaps exasperated or new inequalities are going to emerge. So do you think, is it really a myth that children from higher income families won't be impacted as badly as those who are in receipt of uh, school meals? As many parents have had to work throughout the pandemic, making uh, homeschooling impossible for some and difficult at best for, for most others, what are your thoughts on that? Well, as I said, our um, survey was um, completed by over 2,000 parents mm -hmm. from right across Northern Ireland. And I think probably the, the headline um, um, sort of conclusion from our study was that homeschooling has been experienced in a very different way by mm -hmm. a very broad range of parents. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about homeschooling and you talk about children's experience, it's impossible to talk about uh, children as if it's one homogenous group mm -hmm. or parents as if they're one homogenous group mm -hmm. either. Uh, and what we find, we didn't ask uh, d direct questions about parental income, but we did ask about the highest level of, of parental education. And what we found was that um, children in homes where parents were better educated with degree level education, for instance, um, were likely to fare better. Uh, they were likely to have parents who felt much more confident mm -hmm. about homeschooling. They spent more time um, engaged actively in supporting their children's education. Uh, for instance, rather than simply monitoring what they were doing, they were actually actively involved and perhaps helping to co-teach or you know, help them to understand difficult concepts. Um, those were with better educated parents. Um, they also had more access to devices and Anne has mentioned the, the mm -hmm. issue of, of the digital divide and mm -hmm. we certainly find evidence of that as well. Another issue was um, around uh, internet, internet connectivity and we find that uh, some parents, particularly in rural areas, struggled to get access mm -hmm. to the resources, mm -hmm. most of which, let's be honest, were sent through um, VLEs or Google Classroom or by email yeah. and, and so on and so forth. We find that some children were struggling to get, um, to get sight of a, uh, of a tablet. Maybe they only had uh, a mo one mobile phone in the household. Uh, we did find that everybody had some access, bar a, a handful, literally mm -hmm. a handful uh, of children. Um, but it might have been a, one mobile phone shared between two or three siblings, possibly also with the parents as well. Mm -hmm. And that ranged right through to some households who had multiple tablets, multiple large screens, multiple PCs and laptops and so on. Yeah. And so we find the experience uh, was very, very different um, across the population. So in terms of inequalities, you know, uh, my, my fear, and of course we don't have hard evidence yet of attainment through lockdown, mm -hmm. but my concern and my fear 
is that existing inequalities will have been exacerbated uh, through the experience of homeschooling. We'll wait and see. I mean, we'll, we'll know better in, in August and September. And, and not that I'm suggesting we rush into a series of tests in, in August and, and September, but I think teachers will uh, will know better um, in the autumn what exactly the differences have been. But I've, I've written about this lockdown, lockdown learning gap uh, that I can see emerging and is very likely to emerge and is very likely to be greater than what would have happened normally over the summer break. During the two months, uh, nobody would normally have been learning anything, so the gap would have been um, uh, there, but, but now it would be exacerbated because some children, I, uh, our, our survey would, would suggest, have been doing little or no learning uh, since the middle of March, whereas other children will have really benefited, actually, from almost one-to-one -one tutoring from degree-educated parents. Mm -hmm. And for me, that would signal an exacerbation of existing inequalities. Yeah. And have you any experience in that? I know that you said that you've been supplying IT equipment to families. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anything similar being a concern of parents? Yes, I th yeah, completely. Um, we, yeah, yeah, some parents are, are struggling with not having, as Noel said, not having any devices or um, and not having connectivity. And in fact, we, we were, there was a campaign at the very early days about um, access for all and no child being left behind, no one should be left behind. And it was um, a campaign by a community-based organisation, PPR, and it was, it was highlighting the, the inequalities in relation to access to, to Wi-Fi. And they, they tackled with a, with a conference uh, on Zoom about it. And, and, and essentially then, um, we then, I wrote to the department, wrote to CCA, wrote to anybody who would listen, Queen's University, University of Ulster and St Mary's University to say, look, do you have uh, access to resources that we can, we can distribute? And um, I think that the response from the EAA was, and, and, and this is crucial, I suppose, is that, is Anne, that it's an issue that's been flagged within the department very early on, but a, a community response would be a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And so our community response in our community was a lot quicker than the departmental response. Yeah. And I think so I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in terms of the whole notion of um, and one community worker said to me this morning, actually the met him, he says, Anne, everybody needs to put their shoulder to the wheel. And I think that's the, the key lesson I think is that we can the, the government departments can can learn from community sector is put their shoulder to the wheel interdepartmentally, mm -hmm. making um, joined up decisions when putting children at the centre of that. Mm -hmm. So yes, some schools were very happy to receive um, mm -hmm. b both um, have to say non selective post primary and and grammar schools were happy to receive um, iPads that we were able to get them on behalf of other people. Okay. So thanks, thanks for that. Anne. Uh, you mentioned that. Um, it's children who have been suffering, but adults as well, uh, and their level of attainment really have been impacted as well. So Betty, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit for us in terms of your adult education programme that you've yeah. been running through the community. Um, they too have been impacted and what kind of support uh, have they been getting? And is there maybe a link that can be made towards the, um, the affluent uh, population those with a little bit more income or those with a higher education standard as to how they have been impacted? Mm. Yeah, I would agree with what this people have said here that there's been inequalities that has been exacerbated throughout this. Um, we would be teaching young women and older women. Um, the younger women in the main have children and they would have been maybe doing a basic English and maths course. Mm -hmm. So how they were able to homeschool was extremely mm -hmm. hard for mm -hmm. them because they don't have the knowledge themselves. I worry that we talk too much about technology and it's just about getting everybody a laptop. It's not just about that, it's yeah. about the skills of the parents of these people. Um, so in, in terms of children, that bit I would be saying that you know we need to put maybe extra support into some areas particularly the area that I'm working in and where I come from in the Shankill area where there's it's been well documented that there's very low levels of achievement and has been for years mm -hmm. so there's a generational thing that goes on there the women the some of the women that we did have in because um, we run from basic um, English and maths right through to GCSEs and we were doing a childcare course, they were doing a counselling course. We have been, they all had to stop 
um, and if they couldn't be done digitally, the education manager was coming in and photocopying things and sending them out to them, just keeping in touch with them, even by phone call. In order to say, look, it's okay now, you know, you can drop out of this. Some of them dropped out because of their children and they didn't have time to study for themselves because they were trying to do the studying with their children. Um, and we have had to reassure them it'll be okay, that we will take them back in, they can get back on a class all right. Um, and we want to just keep motivation high because for, especially if you're thinking about a young, a young girl, a one parent family who's in a, an apartment or a flat with two kids, I mean, it's horrendous in general, never mind having to homeschool and try and study herself. So we've been doing things like that and taking out packs, maybe even to cheer them up, taking them out packs that they can use with their children. Um, somebody said to me that uh, their children really didn't learn much on an academic level, but they have learned so much life skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's learning and, and we need to look at the, the whole sort of complex, I suppose, mm -hmm. of learning and everything mm -hmm. that that yeah. involves. It really does fall right across the whole spectrum of society, really, yeah. from the children to adults. But there's a group there with special educational needs and they've been particularly um, impacted by, by COVID and by the lockdown. Um, the level of disadvantage that they're experiencing has been quite significant, particularly with the loss of access to, to the variety of support mechanisms. Kula, can I maybe ask you, what can be done to really get these children back to where they were in March before the lockdown? What do they need? Well, I, I, I'm not sure I want them back where they were in March. I think they need they, where they were in March wasn't satisfactory, mm -hmm. um, not from the point of view of the children or their parents, but the services that they were receiving um, uh, for many children left a lot to be desired. And we and when we did a, 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 have done a lot of work and we published in March a report called Too Little Too Late, which was about the experience of, uh, of children with special educational need in mainstream. And indeed, Strand Millis uh, supported us with that with the parents survey. So it is, I think, it's absolutely right to say that the groups uh, of children who experienced inequalities, those inequalities will, may well have been exacerbated and, the, and there's, then there's groups of children who we just don't know what's been going on for them. You know, it, in any home there could be bereavement, parents who are key workers and have been out of the house, regardless of how well they're educated, they haven't yeah. been able. So w w we won't know until we set eyes on children how they are but what we can be fairly confident is the group of children who've had wholly insufficient support not from their parents or from their communities because Anne, uh, Anne's absolutely right as is Betty that the community have stepped in where the state was a bit too slow and that's not acceptable um, but the group of children who have had the worst deal has been children with special mm -hmm. educational needs either those in special schools or those in mainstream schools. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about thousands of children here who have um, a legal entitlement to additional support and resources, and that's not being forthcoming. Mm -hmm. And indeed, our government, as part of the COVID legislation, the emergency legislation, have reduced that responsibility yeah. on themselves to something called best endeavours, do your best. And bearing in mind what I said, that it wasn't good enough before we started this, it is, uh, I, I can't even think of the words to use that would be acceptable um, for broadcast. So um, the work has to be done over the summer to help, fa to, to give families a break, but also to, to remind children and help them be school ready. Yeah. Um, and then um, when they go back to school, they have to, we have to remove best endeavors when we have to go back to what the plan, their assessed needs are and meet those needs and do everything we can. We can't be, we can't be giving them a second class service. Okay, I would agree with that. Noel, you're actually a parent governor of a school uh, and have some experience in this field. What are your views and what kind of preparation is being made in terms of the schools opening up again? Well, I mean, I, I basically agree with what Kula has been, been saying, that, that children with special education needs and their families have um, often struggled enormously through this, and, and that came through our uh, survey as well. Um, and it's not just the withdrawal of the school support, it was respite care, it was all the mm -hmm. th therapeutic support as well. It was even access to grandparents who yeah. could step yeah. in and, and, and take a child maybe for a couple of hours 
two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. It was all of those supports were simply removed overnight. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we also need to acknowledge, though, that it has been a challenging time for special schools um, as well. And, and clearly there are big challenges mm -hmm. across the system. And our survey that we did for the, the Commission highlighted you know, uh, serious challenges in terms of staffing to the EA. Um, capacity and staffing within special schools is a huge issue and a report came out very recently I think that that, that highlighted that and the school where I'm uh, a governor for instance has far more pupils in it now than it was ever built for and it was only built uh, within the last decade. You know so there are big challenges there and, and of course schools and parents have generally been working really well together over the last three months and I think we really need to capitalise on that engagement and particularly around children with special educational needs so that these children will be able to reintegrate as well as possible and there's still going to be big challenges I think in August, September for these children but to try and help them as best they can to try and settle into this new routine mm -hmm. because anxiety levels are high at the moment uh, and they'll probably get higher um, over the next few weeks unless unless schools can, can, can work hard as they are to try and identify what those concerns might be and to try and alleviate them. And one way is actually through using technology. Yeah. Some of the concerns that have been expressed to us at the Commission is in relation to those children with, with special needs and autism being one of them, in terms of going back into the school environment and not having that understanding or awareness to be able to maintain social distancing. And parents are afraid, uh, are very worried about what might happen to their child? Is there any guidance being issued to schools in relation to how to deal with that kind of situation? Because some parents, believe it or not, are actually quite afraid their child might be restrained or um, you know, secluded in some way as to ensuring that they distance from other children. Have, have you any information on that? Well, I think special schools, as with early years, um, phases of education are going mm -hmm. to work around this sort of protective cluster mm -hmm. model, which has been proposed by the Department of Education. Now, um, how, how practical and how successful that will be remains to be seen. But I think that's probably, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. Some children with learning difficulties are not going to understand yeah. Uh, the notion of social distancing. You know, very young children are not going to un understand that either, of course. Um, and so the, the model that's been proposed, at least, is that these protective clusters will at least, um, you know, keep children in a smaller group. So there will be interaction. I think that's inevitable. There will be physical contact with teachers as well, uh, which is inevitable in early years and in special in particular. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to try and work through that as, uh, as well as we can. Yeah. I think most parents will actually find that reassuring. But even along that line of um, being secluded, being e e excluded from the rest of your class, really um, impacts on children who maybe are coming down with COVID symptoms yeah. or are maybe suspected of being ill. And there's been some concern raised by parents that what's going to happen when their child is showing those symptoms? There's been talk about them being put into a room and kept there until they're collected. Have you had any experience of that, Kula? Let me answer the question uh, and support what Noel just said. I would be really disappointed um, and concerned if we saw rising levels of, of, of restraint and seclusion, particularly mm. of younger children or children with special educational needs because they can't maintain social distances. And um, I, I have absolute confidence that our teachers will know exactly how to respond to that. Mm -hmm. We know children can't, but what the other, th we can't, can't do social distance, particularly not the wee ones, or like I said, young people um, uh, with special educational needs. So um, I, I, I absolutely, um, would be, would be really, really concerned if we saw increased uh, levels of restraint um, as a result of children not being able to social distance. Um, and mo moving on, though, to the guidance um, that has been issued by the department and what should happen if a school um, is concerned that a child may have symptoms, their guidance isn't clear enough. And if you read the guidance, it does say a child should be isolated behind a closed door yeah. uh, with appropriate adult supervision or adult supervision as appropriate. The, the guidance is not good enough. And what, we, my, what I can absolutely assure all parents who are concerned about that guidance is that my office will be working with the Department of Education in the, in the couple of months before schools reopen to clarify that guidance and mm -hmm. say that no child, particularly no primary school child, this is what we will be asking for, no primary school child should be locked 
locked behind a closed door by themselves. Mm. Um, they should be with an adult, properly supervised. Mm. Um, and let's not forget, children are the lowest risk uh, group in our society. Uh, you know, very few children have contracted COVID. Few, if any, under fives have contracted COVID. They are, they are neither, uh, they're the lowest risk, not only of getting it, but also of infecting others. That's not to say we shouldn't socially distance, but we need to have a proportionate response and we need to balance. And, and one young person described it to me really well. They said these measures are looking after our physical health but they're not looking after our emotional mm -hmm. health and well-being, and we and you and you have to actually redress that balance. Is what yeah. she said to me, and I thought, well, yeah, classic young person always gets it right. I take 50, 50 uh, words, and she says it in a few. So we have to redress that balance, and let's not frighten our children whilst keeping them and staff mm -hmm. safe. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the guidance on isolation should a child have suspected symptoms of COVID. Is, is elaborated to ensure that we, we maintain the dignity and well-being of the child. Okay. Yes, of course, Betty. Um, that's a hundred percent, I would agree. Um, we have had guidance, but again, it's somewhat mixed up and it's very different from what you've been told as well, Killa. Um, in our childcare setting, we have two, we have isolation rooms set off. Um, we've, we've been told to work in pods of 12 and it's the same scenario, it's all the same kids, same teachers, so everything for, for else. Child, for early, very early years yeah. and after schools okay. um, when that happens. But we've been told that we have to put a child with a worker into an isolation room, but we have to close the pod down as well mm -hmm. until the results of that child comes back. Now this could happen on a weekly basis, which means 12 children could be sent home weekly. Um, so, I mean, I had a, a meeting about it this morning with our childcare managers and they're just saying it's getting more and more impossible to do. Mm -hmm. um, and they're asking for guidance from us, but we're not getting the proper guidance mm -hmm. from where we should be getting mm -hmm. it from. Yeah. Um, there's also the issue of children who show symptoms of other stuff that yeah. can be picked up as COVID. And we have to be really careful in that because, you know, we don't want to close 12 children down if one child sneezes. So the girls have been doing, they did all their training, their COVID training, but we've also been talking to them in a way to, to use a bit of common sense. And the children do have sneezes and coughs and their temperature goes up a wee bit and down a wee bit, and not everything is COVID. But then you have to look at the staff too. The staff are frightened mm -hmm. and what they're picking up from the children and maybe taking home. So it's, it's a very, very hard situation yeah. all round. Yeah. Extremely stressful, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, you know, parents are probably looking at it from the perspective even of childcare and being able to work and the consequences mm -hmm. for their employment if they have to, at a very short notice, come out of their right workplace of work. to yep. look after kids. The stress that kids are really enduring is alarming. And I think the whole issue of the transfer test has added to that and the uncertainty moving forward as to how that's going to be addressed. I know it's a fairly uh, contentious issue as to whether there should be any form of transfer test, but on the understanding that we have it, there are kids and families who want to go through it. How is it just and acceptable that these tests are permitted to continue this year? Who's going to take responsibility for making sure such decisions are given significant impact um, of the tests on the future for the children, their self-esteem, their mental health, can I come back to you, Anne, on that issue? Have you got anything that you would like to share with us? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, in relation to, I mean, I think it, it was just um, unfortunate. I mean, unfortunate. Um, the decision was taken to host a transfer test next year before the decision was taken even to open schools. And I think that was in itself a questionable decision. And. I think, I mean, I, in my experience, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked all my educational career has been on trying to redress the imbalance and the inequality that testing like the 11 plus has, has cre created, both working with women's groups in terms of community development, education, second chance opportunities through the Forum for Community Work Education, where I used to work. And so all of that was on trying to undo mm -hmm. the damage that was done by someone being told at age 11 that they were a failure. So this was uh, an opportunity, I think, for the minister to allow the educate children to start from where they left, to acknowledge 
they're learning. Um, and everybody has learnt over this period of time, maybe not academically as, as to the level of some people, but there has been learning throughout. And I think this was an opportunity to kind of to put aside the test for this year and see how it goes. So I think it's very, it was a very political, um, very political decision. And I think it's, it's been very traumatic for children and it's very unfair for children who will not have had the same academic education experience or academic learning experience mm -hmm. as other children will have on the basis of maybe their, their parental experience or their, their car's experience in terms of education and and the value they place in that education. And so therefore I think it's it's it is definitely um, it has definitely created a wider it's going to create a wider barrier. So there's mm -hmm. already stress and strains. Kula mentioned there about um, child's mental health and well being. Um, and I think that is increasing the stress and anxiety that young people have are, has compounded the stress and anxiety that mm -hmm. they've experienced during this uh, this lo this lockdown. So I just think it's very grossly unfair, yeah. very unfair decision. I, I don't want to get into the debate mm -hmm. as to the rights or the wrongs of the whole transfer process, or otherwise we'll be here for quite some time because there are strong views on on both sides of that argument. However, there are parents and children who want to go through that process. Mm -hmm. Have any of you heard any um, ideas or? Uh, advice coming from grammar schools, secondary schools, in terms of how they're going to actually select pupils if they're not going to do the test? So, we need to be clear about who's made this decision. It's, be, it's, a, it's over 60 decisions made by the individual schools, mm -hmm. grammar schools, who mm -hmm. use academic selection. And you, you're right, the, we shouldn't maybe set aside what we think about academic selection, although everything Anne said is absolutely right. Um, uh, and so, the schools have made the decision, the grammar schools have made the decision. So what we've heard from the grammar schools um, in Newry, Kilkill, is that they will revert to their other criteria. They will take out the, the bit around you have to get the A and the GL and will revert to their other criteria. And we've seen that in some of the other schools, you know, Neskillen and, and, and Lagan. They've just taken out that bit of the criteria. I do think, though, that if schools genuinely, some of those schools genuinely had the best interest of children at their heart, if they showed the same creativity and imagination that the examinations authorities have shown, see her here and, and, and the various bodies across the water and, and in the south, then they could have come up with a solution. Um, because it's absolutely right, they made the decision, and Anne's point is very well made, they made a decision before we knew that we were going back, but even if, even if we had assumed everyone was going back in September, we knew that there was a lot of work to be done, and to put this pressure on children is not acceptable. That was This was announced in May, mm -hmm. five months, well, five and a half months before the first test. Was, you're telling me some of the cleverest people in our education system, both in primary uh, and, and, and grammar, could not have come up with a solution, could not have sat down and put their heads together and come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. And the people who are gonna lose out are all our children, regardless of, of background, all, our, all those 10 and 11 year olds who will, be, who will now have the return to school ruined for them and it will be back on education, on formal education instead of the how can we support you to catch up, how was it for you, how can we support you to, to, to deal with any stresses and strains that you've dealt with. Um, it's, it's wholly unacceptable. Do I have a solution? I've got some ideas but it's not for me, it's for those schools to have put their heads together and come up with a better way and they have plenty of time to do it mm -hmm. and, and, and chose not to. Yeah, some parents might hold the view that having a transfer test levels out the playing field but it doesn't. To, to, to a degree in terms of the those evidence. kids who want to go to the grammar school. However, if you take out the individual attainment of the child and use the other criteria, there is a, maybe a fear that some other inequalities might emerge or some other disadvantage might emerge. Uh, well, it, it, that would be, which is why, why I'm saying that's one solution. There are, there are others. Grammar schools do not. The statistics, if we use uh, deprivation, the statistics are clear. Grammar schools do not level anything. Mm -hmm. The haves I'm have a talking, leg up. I'm not talking about the grammar school. I'm talking about the process of actually getting into the grammar school. For those who that want to go to That doesn't level. Yeah, but that's not a level. No, that I'm, doesn't I'm, level. I'm talking about in terms of the actual number of kids who want to go to that school. Oh, I see what you're then, saying. It's not about where they Everyone live. Everyone can it's take not the about test. Pass, okay. Anyone can take the test. Yes. And if you do well enough that's in that process, point. you're getting into the school. Um, however, if that part of the equation is removed yeah. and you're relying on the other three, four, whatever yeah. number of criteria, 
is there the possibility that some kind of discrimination might emerge in that or disadvantage rather than discrimination? And I, th th there absolutely is. And I suppose the, the, the point is, is, the, is that balancing act. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the, 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 the point is that, um, and again, Anne's point was well made, take it out for the year, let's see how we get on. Yeah. Um, and then we can properly, mm -hmm. as part of the, mm -hmm. uh, the independent review of education that's going to happen mm -hmm. under the new decade, new approach deal, we can probably have a, t take the learning from it. Mm -hmm. the, the school closest to the child should be the best school available yeah. for them. And that's where we, we should be. So, I, yeah. Just, and just to make a point, we have a, a policy with every school a good school, which is in, in, in place since 2009. If every school was a good school, that choice would be taken away. Because everybody, every parent would be happy to send their child to a school beside them that was, that was a good school. The unfortunate um, disadvantage for a lot of our children who are attending non-selective post-primary schools are, is that the school infrastructure is not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. If every single one of us was walking to our local school, and mind, walk into your local school, non-selective post-primary, and look at the school infrastructure and say, is that good enough for my child? And if it's not good enough for my child or my family or any children belonging to me, then it's not good enough for children. And certainly in West Belfast, mm -hmm. you're expected to be educated in a not fit for purpose school. Yeah, and that's the, that's the yeah. inequalities that exist. Um, it fascinates me. I remember sitting talking about this when I did the Burns report, and I don't know how long ago that was. Um, but I still think that we need to, to get more parental involvement. I agree yeah. with, yes, we should, the nearest school should be the best one. But it, it's the way parents think. Parents think that um, the best thing for their child is to go to a grammar school, mm -hmm. no matter what. Mm -hmm. Um, where the best thing could be a secondary school or a school around the corner, um, you know, and I think it, it's a lot up to do with educating parents what is the best for their yeah. child, for their emotional health, their, their you know, even just ordinary things like, um, I suppose if I give you my own experience, my daughter went to Methody and had to go to school an hour earlier than I should have went to the girls' model, which is around the corner. And years later, she said to me, you should have sent me there. Um, she yeah. would have done as well, you know. But of course, at that time, we thought that, you know, Methody was the best place yeah. for her to go because it's grammar school. Yeah, the whole issue of uh, transfer and, and post-primary education is a real hot subject. A lot of different views on it. But Noel, I couldn't ignore you and let you have your say on the subject. So have you anything you want to just contribute to? Just a very to? quick comment, moving it on very slightly, and that is just to say that I would be very concerned about the narrowing of the curriculum for mm -hmm. children coming into P7, yeah. particularly this year. Yeah. Anecdotally, we all know that th there's quite a narrowing in the months running up to the tests mm -hmm. in November and December. This year, above all, I would be extremely concerned that all the other very valuable areas of the yeah. curriculum, which are not assessed um, by either of the main tests, will be completely ignored, even mm -hmm. more so if the pupils are only in front of the teacher on a 50% or 60% basis. Mm -hmm. um, so I would find that really disturbing, I think, from yeah. the from pupils' perspective. To be honest, as a teacher as well, I feel sorry for the teachers, because mm -hmm. uh, they're really caught in the middle of this. You know, the P7 teachers who, this year more than any other year are probably under huge pressure some of it from parents as well mm -hmm. to try and uh, make up the difference of the last few months and to try and you know get their children through the test as as well as they can uh, they're going to feel under huge pressure mm -hmm. as well so that would be my additional concern when really we should be focusing on the the emotional well-being the mental health of mm -hmm. the children coming back um, I suspect that most P7 teachers will feel under huge pressure to focus on test, 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 mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't think that's healthy. Yeah, it's a very stressful time for children moving forward, there's no doubt about that. But maybe to get back onto the, the key issue of, of educational issues within a lockdown uh, easing process, I want to come back maybe to the, the stress on parents as well. Um, Many parents actually avail of like that wraparound care uh, and the extended school provision. And maybe Betty, you might be best placed to talk about this in terms of the parents who leave their children off for early morning yeah. childcare and then late in the evening, even school transport. Mm -hmm. Have you heard any concerns about those issues or have indeed been given any guidance by I've Department heard of Education? Many, many concerns, but no answer to the concerns. Um, again, a meeting this morning, transport was talked about. Um, we talked about we have an after schools programme, so if the schools are only in two days, then they need to let us know what days 
they're going to want the children from and it won't be after schools, mm -hmm. it will be full time daycare. Mm -hmm. um, we need to do a bit of planning and we can't do it without the schools doing it and without people above that again doing it. Mm -hmm. So we need a lot of answers as well. We don't know if we can use, we have a minibus for pickups. We don't know if we're allowed to use it mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't know what parents want to do. Would it, you know, we have been restricted at the moment for, for an eight to five. Mm -hmm. We normally open from seven to six, half mm -hmm. six, um, and we've been restricted with those hours. So parents who are now coming back, we just opened last week, um, who are now coming back have to organise that themselves. And they, some of them are panicking because they're not going to be able to get into work in time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a mess for us in terms of childcare, um, in terms of people getting back to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I understand that the economy has to get up and running, but we'll have to do it in some kind of order and some kind of mm -hmm. planning yeah. here. You know, we're just left at, we really don't know. Okay. Um, we were doing a funding application a couple of weeks ago and we ended up doing it four times because of the changes the government made as we were going along, mm -hmm. you know. So we just don't know either. That's yeah. questions that even people who provide this service are asking. Okay. Kula, have you had any? Yes, yeah, so the Department of Education are working on a set of guidances, mm -hmm. you know, a suite mm -hmm. of them, uh, to, to address a, a, a range of issues and the logistics, um, which is, I think, under the category of new normal, the logistics around transport meals routines, so the staggered starts, are, is is one of, the work, one of the strands. So we are expecting to see guidance around both school transport, because we do tra something like a million miles a day. I think we transport our children, it goes back to Anne's point, every every closer school, you're better, the best school. Um, uh, so uh, we can't, because some of those buses are rammed full of children, and we can't have that. So we're, we're expecting to see guidance um, coming through from the Department of Education that we'll, we'll hopefully be able to to address those some of those issues and and um you're absolutely right it's really important um and and i think it, it also behoves employers and this is again where the equality commission comes into its own to not penalize parents if they have to come out of work and what have you because it, you know w this will be a very stop and start because children will be starting in a staggered um, way in the mornings in order to stop all those clustering, clustering yeah. of adults and clustering of children at nine o'clock or half past nine. So it is going to be, the new normal is going to be very, very different mm -hmm. for, for, and different for nearly every child and, and everyone, including the economy and employers, have to adjust accordingly yeah. during this transition uh, back to a COVID-free world once the vaccine comes in. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's, it's too important a decision, this kind of movement back to a new kind of way of working is too important to be done in isolation by any government department. And I think it has to be done right across the board. The Department of Education should be talking to the Department of Infrastructure. Yeah. Department of Infrastructure should be talking to the Department of Health. They should all be talking together. I mean, practice what you preach. We have in the community voluntary sector been told to work in partnership to network um, to collaborate for years mm -hmm. and yet government departments aren't doing that themselves and so it's, it's very important to take you know cognizance of what's happening in the infrastructure. And it does remind us of the, the statutory obligation that our government departments have every single one of them uh, under the Children's Services Corporation Act they have an obligation oh, yeah. to cooperate in the deliver, delivery the of eight, uh, eight well-being outcomes for children and people of course of which education and health and social and health and well-being is is one so it is the law the law is they have to work they have to work better together yeah. and you can see that happening in pockets and and it's it's they're found wanting in other areas yeah. um, and just just to say that there has been times during this pandemic where I have been very proud of the Northern Ireland executive mm. uh, and the government and have, have thought they have sung uh, sung as one sung from the same hymn sheet mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. acted as one and mm -hmm. I hope we can see mm -hmm. more of yeah. that yeah. Yeah. as we, we, we come out of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just uh, on one point, do you think, did our children learn anything or were they just doing homework? <laughs> do you know something? I think I have to say that, you know, in terms of looking at listening to Zoom sessions, we've, we've just finished a, a pilot um, transfer um, P7 um, transition programme over Zoom with parents and children. And the amount of things that those children have learnt, you know, it, 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 you know, it's amazing in terms of, you know, someone talked about, you know, spending, what was, it, what was your favourite thing during, during lockdown? Um, I got to go on my bike with my daddy. I got to learn how to bake a cake. I got to learn to, to yeah, went to the forest and we had a picnic. 
all those kind of things and that's you know and that's they, they'll remember those things mm -hmm. they mightn't remember how to do their nine times tables but they'll remember the experiences they've had mm -hmm. you know it's about I suppose it's about you know and the, look, look at us in terms of what do you remember from your your learning in school I remember my best friends and I remember different things things that I needed academically obviously I had to do that and took me to the next place in my learning career journey but the things that I really hold dear are those kind of relationships and those and so I think it's, it's, an, it's an important opportunity for us to start where children are at with their learning to allow them to, to validate those experiences to allow them to build on that and to reconnect with their relationships and the most important things that are come, that they've learned mm -hmm. you know during this period of time I think that's what I was trying to say earlier when I said about the children learned a lot of life skills rather than academic stuff mm -hmm. but we held some classes too we actually were able to do it social distancing in a big room um, and the teacher who used to work for us and we helped her go through her teacher training came back and said I've been tortured with parents and I do this for nothing so it was great um, but she had she done different ways of teaching them and it was really interesting you know they had I was saying why is there sweets on the table mm -hmm. but they were counting them and they were doing mm -hmm. things with them um, she had them out in a car park and they were playing games but but she was adding in mm -hmm. English mm -hmm. and mm -hmm maths and different things just out a in different the, way of learning yes. just a very very different and the children loved, loved it, it. Um, to the extent that we were only doing it for a month but they're going to come back now mm. after the holidays and Good continue idea. on the parents were absolutely delighted and we have a waiting list as long as your arm mm -hmm. i can understand yeah. no what about you yeah. i think we've definitely learned the importance of outdoor learning mm -hmm. i particularly appreciated that during that balmy weather we had it in april and may perhaps mm -hmm. a little bit less so uh, at the moment um, so the opportunities, um, I think, to get children away from screens. I think there's been screen saturation, I think is a term that yeah. has been used for all of us, I'm sure, as well as adults, as well as for children. Let's get our children away from screens if we can at all. Let's get them outside. Let's get them playing. Mm -hmm. Let's get them socially interacting and developing relationships. And Anne's absolutely right. A study confirmed that actually in the last few days that I think five times more parents said that the, the uh, relationship they had with their children had improved during lockdown than had got worse. You know, um, so there were real gains, I think, for parents as well, speaking as a parent. The other big learning, I think, that many parents um, said to us in our survey was that they a newfound respect for teachers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and, and I can echo with that <laughs> as, a, as a parent who is homeschooling. Um, you, you know, yes, there's a, the big bonus of parental engagement mm -hmm. that, that's happened in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, parents, I think, now feel much more engaged with what their children mm -hmm. are doing. That's a, that's a big bonus. I think we've all learned as a, as, a, as, a re, as, a, as a human race, really, we've all learned about the prioritization of, of things like health and relationships and, and really how some other things weren't quite as important as we maybe thought were important um, before lockdown. So I think it's important that when, when schools start up and when we all get back to normal working, um, that, that we aim for more of a balanced approach to, to life, to work, to education, to childhood. Uh, and, and so I think we can, let's focus on the positives, I suppose, mm -hmm. going forward. If there was to be a second wave of this, and hopefully there won't be, what would be the key lesson that you would take out of our experiences to date to move forward into the second wave? What would you do differently? Well, I think from an education point of view, I think teachers will feel much more prepared. Uh, I think teachers have done extremely well with, with hardly any time to prepare for this you know, earthquake in terms of pedagogy that, that everyone's experienced over the last few months. I think teachers have gained in confidence and skills. I think some have more uh, further to come still than others. But I think if it were to happen again, I think a lot of the groundwork, a lot of the hard lessons have been learnt. learnt. And as I've said repeatedly through this, that teachers need not feel scared by the technology because good teaching is still good teaching. And our survey actually confirmed that, that, that the parents of, of children were saying that th their children were missing interaction, but they were missing feedback from their teachers. Mm -hmm. They really liked school. They liked to see their teacher, even if it was a recorded five minute video per week of the teacher saying, you know, how are you? How are things going? They liked interacting with, with not just their peers, but their teachers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are, there are I think if it was to happen again, and let's be honest, you know, this could happen again mm -hmm. at any moment over the mm -hmm. next few months. I think, I think in terms of teacher preparedness, I think things should be better. I think even in terms of parental confidence, things should be better. But there remain existing and, and, and enduring problems uh, in terms of access, in terms of uh, parental um, confidence, competence, uh, education, 
uh, ability to support their children. Uh, and so there's still a lot of work to do, but I think surely we can learn the lessons of the last three months. Mm -hmm. Anne? I think, um, yes, I think we have to, you know, collectively, there's been so many some fantastic um, examples of good practice out there that we can learn those lessons, pull them together and be creative in terms of solutions to how we move forward. I think that engaging and engagement with those most vulnerable families who have been under the radar and maybe children aren't having, uh, you know, or, you know, we've been n not looked after very well and um, an instance of, of neglect. And I think we've got to find ways of actually connecting in. And I think schools have been, you know, um, a safe haven mm -hmm. for a lot of those children and a way of actually picking up on some of those issues and I you know teachers and I, I can you know I say I've teacher in my, fa my, my, my head and I seen you know the tears in his eyes when he was saying you know talking to me about uh, reaching out to children who he says and I, I can't I can't get at them they're not answering the phone and I know that child isn't having a good experience and so we've got to find a way a school has been their haven how do we then create havens for those children mm. who have been missed out in relation to both education and being looked after okay mm -hmm. Betty yeah I think I suppose one of the positive things for me is this idea of getting a better work-life balance for everybody getting mm. off the rat race um, there was so much humanitarian stuff went on, you know, the clap and people helping each other and hopefully that will stay with us. And in terms of our centre, we would have more, if, we were, if it happened again, we would be able to do things a lot quicker because we've experienced it now and, you know, we know what we're looking towards. Um, but I think we all should be sitting planning now at the moment if it does happen again mm -hmm. and not just if it's another spike if it's another virus i mean i think the whole world needs to have a plan for another virus coming along mm -hmm. but i think we do need to take all grab all the positives out of it that, is, that has happened in terms of just humanity in general mm -hmm. okay Kula, what would you do differently so obviously i'm glad i went last because that just <laughs> wouldn't everybody else but i think um, again the point about no child should be left unseen or unengaged with um so that there's that general point there but i think the the the, the thing we should absolutely hang our head in shame about is what we have done um or the little insufficient support we have given children with disabilities uh, those attending special schools and those um, attending mainstream and i'm not blaming schools i think there's an issue about the support that those schools mm -hmm. were given to be able to provide a service mm -hmm. because those schools are safe havens but those schools as Noel's already said are are pods of therapeutic interventions of well-being interventions of respite for parents and we must never ever ever abandon those families ever again and the one lesson i've learned and i remember Remember when, when schools closed, parents contacted us and said, give them some time. We've closed it, we've closed quickly, give them some time. But special schools felt abandoned yeah. and in turn their parents and children mm -hmm. felt abandoned. And best endeavours must go out of the window and we must, we must meet, meet those children's yeah. right to education, support and health. Yeah, I think I would agree with each and every one of you. I think there are inequalities that our young people have faced over the years. I have a big fear that those inequalities are going to be exasperated, that new inequalities are going to emerge. I think going forward, we really need to start planning now yeah. that it may well happen, that it will happen, it will. and hopefully it won't, but we need to be planning for it. We have done our best today to address many of the concerns that you have and, and answer the questions. There have been so many being put forward to us that we haven't been able to deal with them all. We've tried to take the general themes that have been coming out of those questions. If you have any concerns moving forward, uh, please feel free to contact the Equality Commission to contact Kula with the Children and Young Persons Commissioner and we will try to help you for, move forward as best we can. But thank you for joining us.